Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 443 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by, you already know, the main man, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers, former heavyweight world title challenger. How are you? I'm good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Uh, We're going to dive straight into the review part. Again, Eddie, I don't know what you saw, so if there's anything you want to chip in in, chip in on then certainly do so we're going to start here though last friday it was at the red owl boxing arena in houston texas usa it was live on the zone um yeah i didn't actually see it but friend of the show ernesto mercado now 15 and oh he's still got those 14 ko's because he picked up another knockout here in round four against dana Berrio, who'd never been stopped in his four losses. He's now 22-5 and five with a draw. Gets stopped for the first time in four rounds there. Ernesto Mercado with a good win, like I say. Moving now to Germany at the Frankenstolz Arena in Aschaffenburg, Bayern. Over here, Luka Plantic, uh, the undefeated fighter, moved to 8-0. and A TKO for him in round five against the UK's Jack Cullen. Um... I believe it was a body shot that stopped Jack Cullen, which isn't the first time in his career that that's happened. He's now 22-6 and six with a draw. Always game for a fight. Jack Cullen much better than he gets given credit for being. It was for the WBC International Super Middleweight title. Moving now to another part of Germany at the Stad Hall in Falkensee, Brandenburg. Over here, Bakram Murtazaliev. Wow. It was for the vacant IBF World Super Welterweight title. He is still undefeated. A crazy fight. He's now 22-0. and 0. He knocked out in round 11 Jack Kulkai, now 33-5. and 5. Kulkai completely dominated the fight. And he hurt Murtazaliev, you know, several times. And suddenly it all just come... You know, it all just come unraveled for him in in that in that eleventh round, and yeah, you know, he, he just got caught with a few shots, could not recover, and he was gone. He was absolutely gone. And like I say, he got stopped there in a fight. He was cruising. It was a crazy turnaround, one of the maddest you'll ever see, to be honest with you. So Murta Zaliev picks up a belt at 154. I'm sure all the guys will be, you know, licking their lips. They'd, uh, you know, they, there's going to be loads of guys who want to fight him. You know, they'll look at him as easy pickings. I think Errol Spence, that'd be a good fight for him to pick up a belt at 154. Though, I don't think he is top of the deserving list. Um... Moving now to the Fontaine Blue in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. It was live on the zone again, Eddie. If you saw any of this, please jump in. This is the final card to mention of the review part. We have whizzed through it. We're going to start down the undercard. Mark Castro with a win now, 12 and 0, a unanimous decision over 10 rounds against Abraham Montoya. Now 22 and 6 with a draw. Provided a good stiff test there. Um, it was a good fight actually. It was for the vacant WBC Continental America's super featherweight title. Um, yeah, so that that was good stuff there for Mark Castro. Also on the card, Diego Pacheco, now 21-0. A unanimous decision over 10 rounds against the previously undefeated and very game Sean McCalman. Now 15-1, and one, he loses his O. It was the battle of the undefeateds. It was for the WBC USA and WBO International super middleweight titles. Um, yeah, it was a much tougher fight for Pacheco than expected, you know, he didn't start well, um, you know, a lot of people had him losing the first few rounds, but to be, to be fair to the guy, you know, he finished really well, um, and, and he was the rightful winner, but like I say, it was a bit of an uphill battle going into the sort of later rounds, because, you know, 
for whatever reason, it just wasn't clicking early on for him. But look, as they say, it's it's a marathon, not a sprint, and it was a 10-round fight. And, you know, he comes back and gets the win. Like I say, I think he deserved the win. But he, he had to do a lot in the second half of that fight to, you know, to uh, solidify the win, I think. Um, so, yeah, he, he finished well. That was good to see. Um, I'd like to see McCalman again. You know, he had a good chin. He took some big shots and come right back. I'm sure he's going to, you know, uh, be back in a in another big fight, hopefully testing another prospect. I wouldn't mind seeing him in with someone like a Zach Parker type of guy. I think that would be a decent a decent test. Um, what else did we have on the card? Galau Yafai now 7-0, and a TKO for him in round 8 of a scheduled 10 for his WBC International Flyweight title. His opponent, Augustin Gauto, stopped, like I say, in round 8. TKO victory for Yafai. Gauto now 21-2. and Yafai cut from an accidental headbutt in round 6. Um, typical kind of Galau Yafai performance, I think. You know, he was dominating early on. Then he lets his opponent get back into it a little, a little bit. I don't know if it, you know, if it had everything to do with the cut or not, because we have seen this before from Cal Yafai. Um, you know, an untidy last couple of rounds where he seems to kind of, you know, it, it becomes a little bit too competitive, especially for a guy with his skill set. Um, yeah, you know, like I wouldn't say he he loses rounds as such late on, but they become very much nip and tuck. They become more like fifty fifty. You know, like. Uh, he doesn't fight to his to, to the best of his abilities late on in fights, it seems. But you know what? Credit to him. He hasn't really had any easy fights. He hasn't really had any walkover fights at all. They've they've kind of thrown him in. You know, they're fast tracking him. I understand that. And I guess that's what's supposed to happen. You know, he's not supposed to win these fights with complete ease. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's another box ticked, I think, for Galau Yafai and 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 the you know the train continues um also on the card sky nicholson friend of the show now 10 and 0 but more importantly now the new wbc featherweight champion of the world a unanimous decision over 10 twos against sarah mafood who's now 14 and 2 um complete domination from nicholson you know everything was behind the jab she looked really good and she's a legit world champion now, you know. She didn't really lose a round. I think maybe one of the judges might have given um, Mafood, I think, one round, if I'm not mistaken. So a shutout on the other two, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, it was it was dominating. She said that Mafood had won a few rounds against Serrano. She's not going to win any against me. But on one judge's scorecard, you know, one judge did give her a round. Um, but yeah, like I say, I would like to see the Amanda Serrano fight, obviously. Um, it would be for the undisputed title because Serrano has the other three. But I don't... It's a good fight. I'd like to see it. But I don't know if I would say Sky is ready just yet. Um, again, I don't want to contradict myself there. I would like to see the fight, but I'm not entirely sure that that you know Sky can win that at the moment. I, I think she probably needs a little bit more pro experience, and at the same time, Amanda Serrano, I think, is is putting more and more miles on the clock. So it might not be a fight for next. But having said that. They are the two champions at the weight, you know? Like, you win a world title, there's no more easy fights anymore. So, I don't know what the plan is going to be. She does want the Serrano fight. It's a winnable fight, I think. I really do. But, it'll be a tough one. Um, anyway, let's move on. Let's move on to the final fight to mention. Richardson Hitchens, now 18-0. A unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Gustavo Lemos, now 29-1. and 1. He wanted to be 30-0. and 0. Some people think he should be 30-0. and 0. It was an eliminator for the IBF Super Lightweight World title, which is currently held by Subriel Matias. Um, yeah, I have to say, bit of a mad fight. Um, obviously, Hitchin's friend of the show, he really struggled to get into a groove. He really did. It, it just... It just wasn't happening, you know, it wasn't flowing like we normally see him flow. Um, like I say, couldn't get into that groove at all. Um, as we know, Lemos has got a very unconventional style and his overall pressure, I think, was a big problem for Hitchens. Hitchens at times didn't seem like he knew what to do. Um, I wasn't scoring it, but 
I did think that that Richard um, that Richardson Hitchens was quite lucky to get that decision. If I was pushed, I'd say he lost. But having said that, I would need to 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 be fair about it and actually go back and score all twelve rounds, which I didn't do. Um, he did spend the better part of Sunday tweeting about the fight as well, trying to convince himself he won clearly in the fight, which definitely didn't happen. But no, it wasn't a good look. Um, Lemos really took it to him. You know, he definitely hurt Richardson Hitchens a few times. And Lemos, you know, he's got legit power in both hands. And he definitely deserves another big fight. I would like to see the rematch. But again, this is a guy from Argentina who doesn't have a massive fan base. And, you know, doesn't speak English. And these things massively work against you when it comes down to the politics of boxing. So I don't think they're going to give him a rematch. They're probably going to run a million miles the other way. Which is a smart thing to do if you can get away with it. And that is what's going to happen. He's going to be able to get away with it. Because no one is banging the drum for Lemos, unfortunately, I don't think. Um, I don't know who he's promoted by. Obviously boxed on you know, a matchroom show with, with Richardson Hitchens being a matchroom fighter. So, yeah, I think Lemos, he's lost the fight, but he's also potentially messed up, you know, him, his chances of getting another big fight anytime soon because they're going to look at that and go, no thanks, don't need any part of that. I think he's right up there in the who needs him club, as they say in boxing. Who needs to fight Gustavo Lemos? Absolutely nobody. But yeah, like I say, overriding feelings. Um, Hitchens, I think, was lucky. Um, like I say, I'm going to start repeating myself here a little bit, but just could not get into a groove at all. And and yeah, it was it was a tough, tough fight. At times, he was made to fight Lemos's fight, and Lemos was coming off good, you know, better better in those exchanges. And Richardson Hitchens as well, not used to seeing him get hurt, not used to seeing his legs stiffen, not used to seeing him on the ropes kind of, you know, dancing around trying to, dare I say, run to get a little bit of breathing space. It's not what, you know, I expected and um, not what many other people expected. So a bit of a shocker there, but they've managed to protect his O, I think. But like I say, he's a friend of the show. I'm happy for him and... I'm doing him probably a tiny bit of an injustice here, talking this passionately without even scoring the fight. But yeah, just from what I could see, didn't look fantastic. But anyway, that brings the review part to a close. It's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated lightweight with that 100% perfect knockout ratio. He's from Maidstone. His hands are made of stone. He is, of course... Mr. Sam Noak. Sam, welcome back on the show, my man. Oh, thanks for having me, mate. You, it's a shame this ain't ever video. I'd see the smile on me face when you do that announcement, mate. <laughs> I'm sure we'll video it one day. But yeah, Sam, we last spoke back in January. At the time, you were getting ready for the Lewis Sylvester fight. Um, yeah, you told me, you know, he's a good mover. But give it a few rounds, and when them legs slow down, I'll get to him, is what you said. I was ringside for the fight. I told a few people around the press rows. I said, I reckon round four, and you got him in round four. A one-sided yeah. fight. Talk me through it, my friend. Well, yeah, I mean, he started really well. I think he had a really good first round. And I know, obviously, chatting to people after, I thought if he could keep it up for 12 being a bit of a bother, but we knew he was a good mover anyway, but I knew I knew what I had to do. It was like, as I said before in the press conference leading up to that fight, it's a fight that we both know exactly what each other's going to do. So you can sort of plan for that anyway. And I mean, it didn't help that that was a bigger ring than they normally have as well. I think that was a 22 foot. Yeah. Um, we got the job done anyway. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, we have to talk about it. Fabio Wardley had 17 KOs in a row. He went the distance the other week. It's now you and Hamza Shiraz both tied on 14 consecutive knockouts, both tying the record for the most of any active British fighter. How happy are you with that? And what would you have said if someone would have said that to you after your pro debut, that this would be be the case after 14? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to still be going, really. Obviously, this will be number 14, so hopefully, nearly with 14, I've only got 13, so fingers crossed I can uh, I can level him. But, um, yeah, I mean, we always always wanted that 10. I think anything else is just a bonus, really. It'd be good to keep on going and then maybe get to 15, but obviously, Mendy is a tough customer, so we will see. 
Yeah, apologies there. I came up with 13, but you're already tied, aren't you? Or his hands are in front. No, I think he might be 14, you know, because I'm 13, isn't I? No, no, you're both 13. Just double checked. You're both tied. Oh, oh even better than yeah. I said but 14, then, yeah, but it, it was actually 13 for both of you, yeah. Yeah, well, fingers crossed then. I can, uh, I can put it in the lead after this next one. <laughs> you, it, you said the future, hopefully that's what we're saying. And, and yeah, you've come a long way in terms of, of, of the journey, the knockout journey. I remember when you were on eight KOs and you were trying to get to nine to tie the gym record with Archie Sharp. You've ran away with it now. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's in time, a lot of time ago now. Eight fights, that was to Sean Cooper, that was. Yeah. After my eight. It's mental, it's so crazy how quite far I'm going. Yeah, yeah. And I always say that um, the only reason it took you nine rounds with Sean Cooper is because until round eight, you thought it was Sean Noakes, and then you realised it was Sean Cooper <laughs> and got him out the next round. <laughs> uh, if, if it was Sean Noakes in front of me, I probably would have tried a bit quicker. <laughs> oh, God. Let's talk about your next one. You mentioned <laughs> you mentioned it. Uh, yeah, not not long to go now. April 20th at York Hall. You'll be boxing for that vacant EBU European title against, as you say, the very sturdy contender, Yvonne Mendy. He's been around for ages, Mendy, Sam. Um, how much yeah. have you and the team studied him? Yeah, I mean, we, we've watched him. Watched a few of his later fights as well. There ain't as many on him as you think for how many fights he's had. But, uh, yeah, listen, he's a tough customer, you know, I mean, he's the fight we sort of want, really, like, he's going to bring the best out in me, and I think it's, like, obviously, everyone always talks about world titles and winning all these tough fights, and I think this is just to, to show everyone what I'm about, really, but as you say, he's a well-tested customer, I've been hearing there's some big names, bigger than Sam Noakes, anyway, but, um, yeah, I'm just hoping to get a good job done in good fashion, like normal, and then keep pushing on. And talking of getting the job done in fashion like normal, obviously he's never been stopped. Something's going to happen for the first time. Either he gets stopped or you do 12. Um, without yeah, giving exactly. too much away, Sam, how do you see the fight playing out? Uh, I think, to be honest, I think it's going to be... Like, I've always said I like come forward with fighters. I've always said that that's sort of like what I like. And obviously you're called being a small wing. I think you're not going to be able to miss this fella. You know what I mean? I think it's just you've got to play it smart because I reckon you'll be able to hit and get everything you throw. But obviously, on the flip side, when I said to Lewis, Lewis, Lewis Sylvester, moving for 12 rounds is a long time, but so is punching people from loads as well, you know? Obviously, if you're fat, you've got to be a little bit mature and smart with what you're doing. Yeah, 100%. And also, since we last spoke, two guys that you were heavily linked with, obviously Mark Chamberlain and Gavin Gwynn, both boxed each other in Saudi. What did you make of their fight? I mean, obviously, Gwyn showed good heart carrying on, but that eye was just an instant nightmare, yeah. and Chamberlain looked good. Yeah, I think um, credit where credit's true. Like, Chamberlain did look good. I think he performed when he had to. Uh, I think Gwyn was unlucky with the eye. And as you say, we always knew he was tough anyway. We knew he never had quit in him anyway before going into that fight, but he broke through to there. But yeah, I mean, obviously, Mark's flying now. He's back out on the, um, on the Fury card. So, uh, yeah, good luck with him. Yeah, no, classy stuff. And it was a good win for him. Um, also, yeah, as well, we, we, we jokingly mentioned Sean, but what, what's happening with him? Obviously, he only boxed last month. A nice, quick knockout for him again. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. Obviously, he looked good in his, uh, his last outing. I mean, coming back off the injury as well. So, I think it's going to be a big year for Sean. Hopefully, you get a couple of titles under his belt and then, obviously, show what he's about as well. You know what I mean? So, it's, it's exciting times. Excellent, man, excellent. And yeah, obviously we can't not mention that over the weekend your gym has now gained its very own world champion. Excellent stuff, excellent morale. Yeah, she's flying, Sky. I mean, success breeds success, so hopefully she's the first of many, you know. She's back in the gym today, got smiles. Fair play to her, mate. She's absolutely smashing it. She absolutely is. Fantastic. To, to, to see her do that over the weekend was a fantastic performance and like I say great all round for the gym not that you needed a morale boost but it certainly will be one um, just before we wrap things up Sam if you've got any closing words like I say it's always great to have you on you're on quite a lot these days we have you on probably more than most fighters so it's, it's a great it's a great thing all the time yeah just thanks for having me as always and I mean yeah if you want to see a good old dust up tune in on April the 20th I won't disappoint you never do, my friend. I'm sure it'll be a fantastic fight. Sam, as always, the pleasure's mine. Thanks for your time, and we'll speak sometime after the fight. 
Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. I'm going to come to you straight away here, Eddie. Jerron Ennis has signed a multi-fight deal with Eddie Hearn's Matchroom Sports. Um, they haven't said how many fights the deal the deal's for, but it's a multi-fight promotional deal in partnership with Boots Promotions. Big news for Ennis, Eddie, who... Um, yeah, you know, for a long time he was kind of, I don't think he was actually signed to anyone, but he was fighting on, you know, this card here, this card here. It's good that he's actually with a promoter now with a lot of, you know, a lot of push behind him, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, I look at his brothers and how, you know, they were brought through and, you know, they just kind of, you know, uh, um, Farah got to the, television level and um Pooh was 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 close and he was he's extremely talented and just got derailed got caught and knocked out in a, you know a fight or two or something like that and it kind of threw his his trajectory off but trying to do it on your own you know what i'm saying is really really difficult you know as you can be the most talented fighter in the world and if you're not signed or put or or you don't have a mouthpiece or or a person that's going to put you in position uh in the business aspect of boxing to 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 get the fights that are necessary to make you a star you could be the best in the world not ever get an opportunity it's like they always say you know over here anyway that you know there's a guy better than jordan that just didn't get his break to be in the nba uh, and it's similar to that here in boxing, and it's even easier to do in boxing because everything is so separated. You know, there's fighters typically. So there's some. There's. It, it's not really that hard to believe that two great fighters who were like in the same era at the same time, great fighters at the same time, never fought each other. That's not even that uncommon, especially nowadays. So you know, with Boots being as good as he is and as talented as he is. To now be signed with Eddie Hearn, one of the top promoters in the world, is going to get him the opportunities to now be able to prove it. You know what I mean? There's no question that, you know, he's, like I said, he's one of the top talented guys out there. But, you know, him doing it on his own would have been extremely difficult. People could just avoid him. You know what I mean? They could, oh, he's not signed. He ain't got this. He ain't got that. There's too much risk, no reward type thing. You could always put it on that. But now that he got a big, big guy, he, he's going to get the opportunities and we're going to get, I mean, look, it's, it's going to be a crazy ride. And I think he has the goods to be one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. So yeah, it's a good thing. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, it, we'll get it. We'll get a chance to see some great fights in the future. Yeah. All the best to him. Um, uh, moving on to the final piece of news that we have, we've, we've got free action packed, uh, title showdowns on the Canelo Mungia pay per view. Again, the date for that, if you've forgotten, is May the 4th, Cinco de Mayo. Um, we're going to see top welterweight and friend of the show, Mario Barrios, defending his 147 pound welterweight title against Fabian Maidana. I believe that's the brother of, of Marcos Maidana. That's going to be the co main. Also, we're going to see. Another friend of the show, Brandon Figueroa, he gets in with um, Jesse Magdaleno, that one to be for Figueroa's featherweight world title. An interesting factor as well is that Mario Barrios is now with Brandon Figueroa's sister, and they are expecting a baby. That's a side note there, if you didn't know. Um, and also, we're going to see the undefeated WBA welterweight champion he's got. I think the regular title, Stanionis, Imantis Stanionis. He gets in with two-time Olympian Gabriel Maestra. Again, the date for that, if you didn't already know, is May the 4th at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. Should be a good one. Um, I like some of those fights there. Right, that's it for the news. Let's move now to the preview part. We're going to start here with a card that goes down tomorrow at the... 
Ensenada in Baja California, Mexico. Over here, friend of the show, former world champion Maurice Hooker, 23, sorry, 27 and 3 with 3 draws. He steps in with Luis Enrique Luna, who's 15 and 13. It's just basically an under the radar, um, quiet. Return to the ring, really, for Maurice Hooker. Like I say, in Mexico, it's an eight-rounder at welterweight. Maurice Hooker hasn't been in the ring since losing almost two years ago to Blair Cobbs. He's coming off two back-to-back losses because before that, he got stopped at the hands of Virgil Ortiz. He's only got one win in his last four. So, um, yeah, I don't know what is left in the tank for Maurice Hooker, but it's good to see Mighty Mo back. And, yeah, moving now to the York Hall Bethnal Green London. Again, this one goes down tomorrow night. We're going to see over here, return to the ring for another friend of the show, another former world champion, Charlie Edwards. It's been a long time. 18-1 and one is the record right now. He steps in with Georges Ori, who's 17-3 and three with a draw. It's for the vacant WBC International Silver Bantamweight title. Um... Yeah, haven't seen Charlie Edwards for quite a while. He's been very, very inactive. Only had the one fight in 2020, the one fight in 2021. He didn't box in 2022. He had the one fight in 2023. And here we go. He's back in 2024. So very, very inactive. Um, Like I say, gets in with this guy who is a French southpaw, but he's only five foot five, super flyweight, this one, like I say. Um, been in there with Karim Gwerf. He actually retired on his store after nine rounds, so we know him. Been in there with Jeffrey Dos Santos as well. It's going to be a good fight, I think, and it's going to be good to see Charlie back. Obviously, you know, he's still on the intro every single week on this podcast. We were supposed to see another friend of the show on the undercard, Lerone Richards, but unfortunately, his fight fell through in the final stages this week. We're also going to see, though, another friend of the show, Elliot Wow, on the undercard. He looks to to move to double figure wins he's currently 9 and 0 he steps in with Joseba Diaz over 6 rounds at welterweight Diaz has a record of 7 and 1 the Spaniard 30 years of age don't know much about the guy at all um the guy that he actually lost to was undefeated, and then he come back and avenge that one loss as well. So he's beaten everyone he's been in a ring with. So that's an interesting factor there. All the best to Elliot Wow and Charlie Edwards. And moving now to Saturday, this one goes down on the zone at the Manchester Arena. Uh, there's a couple of good fights on this car, but then there's a couple that I think are a little bit poor. Um, it's a little bit. I don't know if it's an... Is it a next-gen? I don't know. It's kind of got that feel to it. Um, it's a small... It is a small card. Let's start, though, with the undercard. We're going to start here with... I mean, I say it's small. I mean, there's two world title fights on the card, so... You know, I don't want to. I don't want to discredit it too much, but obviously they're female world title fights. Let's start with Rhiannon Dixon, nine and zero, fighting for the vacant WBO lightweight world title over ten twos against Karen Elizabeth Karabahal, who's twenty two and one. The one loss inflicted by Katie Taylor back in twenty twenty two. Other than that, twenty two wins. Both ladies, though, not really punchers at all. Um, Karabahal's only got three stoppages in her 22 wins, and Rhiannon Dixon's just got the one stoppage in her nine, so you'd expect it to go the distance. But it's going to be a tough fight, I think, for Rhiannon Dixon. She did look very, very good, though, when she stepped in with um, Katarina Fanders last time out. That was really impressive. And also, the one stoppage came against Vicky Wilkinson, which I think was a good win. You know, she's a tough girl to get the stoppage over her. was quite impressive. But yeah, you know, Rhiannon Dixon seems to be improving, you know, fight by fight. So it's going to be interesting, but you'd have to back her to win on points for sure. Also on the card, another one you'd probably have to back the champion. Well, I say the champion, they're both champions, but you'd have to back the home fighter, Ellie Scottney, 8-0 in a 10-2s contest against Segaline Lefebvre, who has a record of 18-0. So she's quite a bit more experienced, um, the French lady, who... Only has one KO to her name, and obviously Ellie Scottney still looking for stoppage number one. So again, you'd have to say Scottney points. I think there could be some decent money here in a little parlay. I think those are pretty much nailed on those two there, I'd say. But yeah, anyway, the French lady is managed by, or promoted by, I'm not sure, Lee Eaton. 
Um, I think he's I think he's a manager. So yeah, Lee Eaton for those that remember, obviously was the uh, the face of MTK Global. So he's got he's got um, the French lady, and you know by all accounts she's a good fighter. It's going to be a tough fight, but obviously you'd have to you'd have to favour Ellie Scottney. But a good a good fight there. You know, two undefeated ladies getting it on in a unification. Scottney with the um, She's got the IBO title, obviously, defending that. And, yeah, the main event is Jordan Gill, 28-2 and two with a draw. It's a 12-rounder here at Super Featherweight. He's coming off the win of his career, it has to be said, when he stopped Michael Conlon up there in Belfast. He gets in with Zelfa Barrett these days, 30-2. and two. Coming off a not-so-great performance last time out against Costin Ion. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a good fight, to be honest with you. I think... I think, and I've said it for a long time, you know, I think Michael Conlon's pretty shot, and I think that Jordan Gill was made to look very good against Michael Conlon. I massively favour Zelfa Barrett in this one. Um, Zelfa Barrett doesn't tend to get stoppages. I don't think he's a massive puncher. You know, this this pretty much looks like another fight that will probably go to distance. If you know, if you look at it on paper. However, I wouldn't be surprised with a stoppage from Barrett. So I think. Just Barrett to win the fight, I would say. Um, I think you can get about sort of one to two on that. So, again, I think those odds are quite nice. You know, I don't really, I don't really, I can't really see Gil winning this one. But, yeah, Zell for Barrett to win by stoppage. Haven't checked the odds on that. But, again, probably a good price. It could happen. It will probably happen, though, in the second half of the fight if I was really pushed to narrow it down. I don't know if we're going to see a stoppage in the first six rounds. But Zell for Barrett to win... Um, in my opinion, you know, that's how I see it going. Um, but all the best to Jordan Gill. I think we've all kind of got a soft spot for him, you know, after that Conlon fight. It was amazing to see that post fight interview. I remember kind of rewinding the TV and going back and watching it again. You know, he spoke so honestly from the heart. You know, he was talking about how he, he, he drunk a whole bottle of vodka and tried to kill himself just a few months before that fight. You know, his 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 career was looking like it was was over, really. His wife left him, he, he got a divorce, and you know, he he goes out there as the underdog, and stops Michael Conlon, so yeah, he's coming off a fantastic, fantastic win, and I like the guy, I think we all do, like I say, but I'm not sure he's going to have enough to become victorious here against Zelfa Barrett, who, yeah, is, is, is really, you know, a good fighter, I rate Zelfa Barrett. I don't know where his ceiling is, but I certainly rate him. And moving now to the final card to mention, it goes down at the American Bank Center in Corpus Christi, Texas, USA. It's going to be live on ESPN. Let's talk about it here. Um, let's start with... I don't know what the main event is, to be honest with you, but I'm going to just go to a few random fights and work our way up and down here. Uh, we're going to see Ruben Villa back in action. He is currently 21-1. and one. He's a good fighter, to be honest with you. I think good enough to win a world title. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it feels like he's been a little bit kind of inactive. Um, I haven't seen him on many top-ranked shows. Obviously, this is a top-ranked show here. Um... So, yeah, I don't know when he last boxed. I do just want to have a little look. Basically, he lost to Navarrete back in 2020. Since then, he's had three fights. He didn't box in 2021. Only one in 2022 and then two in 2023. So, all the best to him. He returns to the ring here against Christian Chacon, who is 22-6 and six with a draw. Never been stopped. Once again, you'd probably expect Ruben Villa to win on points. He's not really much of a puncher. And this guy has never been stopped. So, again... Probably worth a little look there at the odds for the points win. Um, what else do we have? That's over 10 rounds, by the way. Um, we have... Return to the ring for Robson Consasau, currently 17-2 and two with a draw. However, some people, I'm sure, would say that he should be 18-1 and one with a draw, and he should, maybe, have a world title or two around his waist. A lot of people felt he did enough against Emmanuel Navarrete. I think I was one of them, if my memory serves me right. He steps in with Jose Ortiz, who's 15-1 and one with a draw. That's over eight rounds there at Super Featherweight. I feel sorry for Consasau. You know, I really do. Like, he's he's going to be pushed down the undercard. I hope he gets televised, because I think he really deserves it. But there are a few names here. Like I say, I think they're giving Ruben Villa a bit of a push now um, after, you know, 
after a bit of inactivity. And then obviously the heavyweights, everyone's going to want to see them. So I hope that Consasau does get on the TV portion because he certainly deserves it. You know, he certainly does. He, he, he more than did enough there against, against Navarrete. Also on the card, another red-hot prospect, Abdullah Mason, 12-0. and He steps in with Ronald Ron, who's 14-5. and Mason has got 10 KOs from his 12 wins. It's over eight rounds there at lightweight. Ronald Ron's only been stopped the one time. You've got to go back to 2019. He lost to Hector Luis Garcia, who we know went on after that to become a world champion. Um... He's also got 11 KOs himself, so both men can certainly punch. Moving up the card once again, I think this one's going to be a fun fight while it lasts. Effia Jagba, 19-1, stepping in with Guido Vianello, 12-1 with a draw. That's over 10 rounds. I don't think that goes 10 at all. We know that Vianello is a big puncher, and I don't think he has the best of gas tanks, and I don't think he holds the best of shots. A Jagba, like we've said a few times, Eddie, seems to be improved him fight by fight to be totally honest with you and I would favor him to get the stoppage against Vianello but again if you're being safe I think the bet is that that one does not go to distance um, and also return to the ring for friend of the show Jared Big Baby Anderson 16 and 0 he's back in a 10 rounder um, obviously he didn't look too great last year against Charles Martin he has had one fight since then he boxed Andre Rodenko managed to stop him which was quite a good look because he don't often get stopped even though he's about 73 years of age these days but anyway this time he's in a 10 rounder he steps in with 32 and 2 Riyad Murray with 26 KOs the Belgium fighter um Thing is, he is a former cruiserweight. That's the downfall, you know. He, he he's a former cruiserweight. However, he's coming off his career best his career best win last time out, getting a split decision win over ten rounds in France against Tony Yoka. So, um, yeah, he's going to be full of confidence. But like I say, you know, he, he's he's a former cruiserweight. He's been in there with the likes of Kevin Lorena. In fact, Kevin Lorena actually inflicted a defeat on his record, and he also got stopped in 11 rounds to Arsene Gulamirian, who we saw last weekend, or the weekend before, um, you know, lose to Gilberto Ramirez. So, anyway, I'm going to come to you, Eddie. If there's anything on that card that you like the sound of, whether it's Big Baby Anderson against Riyad Murray, uh, both guys can punch, whether it's Effia Jagba getting in with the Italian Stallion, Guido Vianello, I don't know if they call him that, but I'm going to call him that. Um, and yeah, Robson Concesau on the undercard potentially should have been with a, a, a world title or two defending him. Man, I mean, it sounds like a great card. You know what I mean? Not much to say, you know, as far as the matchups, but, you know, obviously with two punches in the ring, as uh, F.A. Jagba and, and, and who is it? The Italian, is that who he's calling the Italian Stallion? Guido Vianello, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like the Italian stallion. That should be his name now. But anyway, um, anything like that, you especially with heavyweights, you want to see the fireworks. Most people are definitely going to enjoy that fight from what you say. Uh, I haven't saw much of Vianello, but he, he, he's a puncher who doesn't have a great gas tank. Believe me, he's going to be going for the kill early. And, you know, I mean, with 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 him being uh, a puncher, but also has, you know, you say he may not hold the punch that well, you know, with that, with, with the ability to, to lose, it also makes it more exciting. So yeah, that fight in particular is going to be something you might want to circle. Kansa Sal has some unfortunate luck recently. And, you know, hopefully this, you know, in the next, in the coming, coming months he'll, or, or year, or, or or so he'll he'll get an opportunity to be actually a world champion and get the decision, and obviously in in the fight. But as far as the rest, I'm just you know obviously seeing Big Baby come back. You know what I mean? And and, and that fight that he had was not an easy fight. Uh, you know he you know he's a the kid's a former world champion. He's been in there with high level guys. Regardless of what was talked about, he that still wasn't an easy fight for. He wasn't just going to go in there and just win it. You know what I mean? That was a hell of a it was a hell of a step up, and and it actually showed to be that. So yeah, I'm excited to see him back in, and yeah, looking forward to the card as a whole. There we go, Fast Eddie with his stamp of approval should be a good one. I think there's a few good fights over the weekend, like I say, and a few 
good opportunities, I think, for some smart bets. Like I say, I wouldn't be surprised with Jordan, G- uh, sorry, with with Zelfa Barrett winning by any method. Ellie Scottney to win on points. Rhiannon Dixon to win on points. Effie Jagba fight to not go to distance. Um, and Jared Anderson, I don't know, maybe by stoppage to Murray considering he did get stopped once upon a time at Cruiserweight. Ruben Villa as well, probably with a points win. I I think there's a nice few parlays that can go down there. So best of luck to anyone that gets on all of that stuff. I'm sure that myself and Eddie will manage somehow to lose some money again. (laughs) But there we go. That brings the preview part to a close. In part one, we did the review part. Then then we welcomed our special guest. And that guest, of course, was the hard-hitting knockout machine. He's from Maidstone, his hands are made of stone, that man being Sam Noakes. And then of course in part two we did the news part, we just wrapped up the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'm going to do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 443 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout-out to this week's special guest, the hard-hitting knockout artist, Mr. Sam Noakes. All the best to him on April the 20th at York Hall. He's in a great, great fight. Cannot wait for it. The biggest thanks, though, of all goes to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That is about everything from myself, though. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again same time next week.